mean, if you're fitting to sit on the floor and see it and sit on the side and not see it. Or not, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I've just kind of hurriedly thrown together all these photos and I'm just going to sprint through them. If anyone wants any, uh, has any questions, just shout them out. I may uh, throw to Richard Thompson over there in case I don't know any of the answers. Um, but this is just like a collection of stuff over the last two summers uh, involving a bit of trail running and climbing and pack rafting, as you can see. So this is our trip from a couple of summers ago, uh, which is the Hollywood Pike, which I have handily put together this uh, color-coordinated map where before the floods you could drive to the end of the Hollywood Road, so you don't do that anymore. <laughs> Um, and then you just put your rafts in, you follow the Hollywood River down to the coast, um, pack them up, hike inwards to uh, the Pike River, uh, and then jump back in your boat, cross another couple of lakes, and then hike back out to the road. And we did this, I think, in like six days. And uh, we had some pretty amazing weather, and some pretty average weather. Uh, this is us. We had uh, two doubles and two singles, which were all hired or loaned by some nice people. Um, the river itself is nothing harder than, I think, grade two. The biggest problem is um, just, big, just logs in the river. And uh, we started really late and then got to the Hidden Falls hut. Uh, I think this was like Boxing Day. Um, there's only one section where you need to portage. Uh, and this is the start of the portage, which then goes to this four-wheel drive track, and the portage cuts around, I think it's a three-plus rapid, which this is the tail end of. Uh, actually, I was actually going to start about talking about Fjordland in general. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know how many people have gone to the Darrens, which is in the northern part of Fjordland. Uh, I'm just going to talk as if no one here has been. Uh, but it's basically the most spectacular part of the country. It's all heavily glaciated valleys. Um, the rock in most of the South Island is really crappy, grey wacky, but in the Darrens it's um, granite, diorite. It's generally very solid. Um, and it also rains seven metres a year, so <laughs> there's like tons of vegetation. So you often go up these big valleys uh, and bash through scrub and then end up pulling up near vertical slopes on snow grass and flax before you even make it to the rock. There's lots of sketchy hiking involved, but there's also the country's best sport climbing uh, and very steep sport climbing. Often the best sport climbers every year will go down to Little Babylon and um, basically try their hand at the hardest routes in the country. So I promise there will be some sport climbing photos in here, uh, although not that many. So anyway, so I'm now back to the pack rafting. Um, first day was very, this is day two. Um, this is on Lake Makiro. So we got really lucky here. There's some friends of ours went a week before, I think one of them was even here, Megan, where you guys had to get out because of the wind. Is that right? So if you, if you hit this part of the lake and the tide's coming in and you have a headwind, you basically have to get out and walk, which really sucks. And if you don't, and just luck it out like we did, then you can just paddle across the lake. Um, it was actually really cool to have it cloudy because it was um, super moody, as you can see. And every night we get to the hut, we'd be pretty soaked and pretty frozen. We'd basically walk up to the hut, strip naked on the deck, <laughs> hang everything up, wring it out, hang everything up, and then go inside, put on our dry clothes, and sit over the fire. Um, so it was always a bit of a gear explosion. Uh, this is towards the end of the lake. And then eventually you hit Martin's Bay, which is um, on the west coast. It's where you have to get out and do an obligatory running jump for a photograph. <laughs> Varying degrees of success in terms of elevation, as you can see. <laughs> um, and here we actually got this incredible blue sky that came in. Uh, there is a hut here where we. Um, had lunch, and then you start the first part of the hiking. Uh, you roll up all your boat stuff. And, How cool is that? Um, it's all just quite heavy. And the hike in goes through some very muddy areas. Uh, it goes along the coast by a seal colony, then through some mud. Derek, uh, there was a question here. Oh, How sorry. cold was the water? What's that? How cold was the water? 
Was it like wet or cold? Was it like Which water? Water that was that you were sitting in, not the water that was falling on your head. <coughs> like when we were rocking? Yeah. It's pretty cold. <laughs> like you don't want to be wearing any cotton. I didn't have a thermometer though, so I can't tell you exactly. Uh, and then you hit the coast again, uh, and then you just walk along this beautiful part of the coast until you hit Big Bay, uh, which has this river outlet, some moist catches, some planes doing some pilot training, uh, and a very large bay. And then there's a hut at the end of the bay. Um, and then the next morning you follow a four-wheel drive track inland, which cuts through, well, which crosses the river, and then cuts through some rivers before you hit the pike. Uh, and then you just put your boat back in the river. Um, which is actually really chill. You often don't need to paddle. Here we have Eva just with the lying down tactic. Uh, and with some of the lakes, we try to use some spinnakers, <laughs> or makeshift spinnakers. Um, this is the one mishap we had when Eva went over some part of the river which split the bottom of the boat, the raft. Um, but we managed to patch it up the next morning. Um, and this is the last hut. Uh, and then we went over to the last lake, which was the only place where we actually got um, stormed on. But we had made it to the hut by the time we, we uh, by the time it rained. There were also some hikers out there who were hiking um, this section as well, and they went through such deep, disgusting mud that they said that they basically had their shorts ripped off them. Um, <laughs> so the pack rafting benefits is basically you get to see the landscape always. I mean, the hikes are really beautiful, but you're always in the trees, and you just watch the landscape as it changes, um, and it's probably a lot less. Effort than hiking as well. <laughs> um, so here are some photos of Mitre Peak. Uh, I think it was climbed first in 1911. This, the logistics are probably the hardest because you have to get a boat out to the Sinbad River mouth, and then uh, then it's just like a bush bash. There is a trail up there apparently, if you can find it, but it's mainly just a bush bash up to the footstool and then following the ridge up to the top. Um, the hardest part is, I think it's like a 1600 meter vertical gain. Um, a lot of people will do it in a day. We did it overnight, and this is the hardest thing about the overnight thing is that there's no water up there except for this massive mud pool. There is a pot up there, it's maybe like a three liter pot, which may or may not have water in it. Uh, but in terms of a, of a climb, it's a pretty basic non-technical but quite exposed climb uh, and if you do have a good day for it it is a really gorgeous it's the mud pool <laughs> I think we did drink some water out of that with some chlorine tablets uh, and we survived so uh, this is where we pitched the tent um, above the tree line which was pretty spectacular and that's the ridge line to the top um, there is a couple of places where you dip down and go back up, and basically there's like these big shields of rock, and you can kind of make it as exciting as you feel like. Um, parts of it will have like uh, like trails that go up big steep grassy bits. Other parts you can just kind of ignore that if you want and just climb up the rock. Um, what's made that pattern there? Is that just rock or is that what is it? That's all rock. Uh, I'm assuming that that's just the glacier that's just carved yeah. it out. But, I'm also not a geologist, so if anyone else wants to answer that question, <laughs> it's also fine. Um, these are some panos from near the top. You can see this knife bridge, which was really awesome. Uh, and obviously a great view across. You can see Pembroke, Totoko, Madeline. Um, and then over here, there's actually Gertrude Saddle. And behind it, you can see the Saber, Marion, Cirque. Uh, and the shadows. Like sunset shadows are pretty spectacular. You can also kind of see here our tent is right down there as well. Um, and then I went up the next day as well. We both went up the next day. This is probably one of the more interesting sections. Uh, and you can see it's also equally beautiful in the cloud. Uh, and then 
and that's the top. So the top actually, you can from the top there's like a, a whole ridge line that goes all the way around uh, towards the Sinbad wall and then back around to Mount Phyllis on the other side. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever done that. Good traverse. Uh, yeah, cloud came in pretty quickly, but then we dropped out of it. So this is the Sinbad wall. I think, I'm not sure when climbing started around here, maybe 15 years ago, 20, 15 years ago. Um, and there was a big push for development a couple of years ago. It's basically a 300 meter wall, which is mostly overhanging. Uh, we went here last summer at the start of January, where there was still a ton of snow on the top which meant there was tons of snow melt throughout the day, there would be increasingly more water that would fall off the top, which made climbing here really spectacular. People usually go here in like in February where there's no water danger at all. This was us heading out to the Sinbad Cully, and this is Ben in his extremely pathetic Kmart boats, <laughs> <laughs> which did really hold him very well. And he has a paddle, it looks like he has a proper paddle, but it's actually just held together by tape. Um, and which meant he couldn't really paddle because it would just break. So he was just doing these really pathetic little um, movements with the paddle. And there were some fishermen by, nearby who just thought this was so pathetic that they just gave us a ride out. <laughs> <laughs> it may have been our strategy all along. <laughs> um, the hike up is, goes through this very steep bush line. Um, we had at least a week's worth of food, it took us. Uh, probably 13 or 14 hours to get in there. Um, and when you get in there, there's a huge rock where you can sleep under. There's about four people who can sleep under it, and then two people who can sleep on top. Outside, other bivvy spots around as well. There's a big gear stash in there, um, which has a whole rack, and some ropes, and various things. Um, we climbed the first half of drop zone, and then the next day we did Rainmaker, which is currently the easiest line on the wall. It's a 23, I think it's like 10 pitches, uh, mostly trad, some holds. Um, I think this is on drop zone, this shot, um, which is a, this is a trad pitch. Uh, Rainmaker, the crux pitch is called Beef Jerky, because the person who set it up in an emergency poo situation where he can like use the beef jerky bag. <laughs> um, this is looks like it's raining, but this is like what I alluded to before with the snow melt. So you actually, at this time of year anyway, you climb up and you have a curtain of waterfall that you basically climb behind, which is a really spectacular way to climb. And if you look down below you, it means that there's just rainbows everywhere. So that's an indication of how overhanging it is towards the top because the snow melt is coming off and it's miles away from the wall. Uh, people said when they were developing it that when they were, um, uh, right there. they'd pull off like loose rocks and um, the safest place would be closest to the wall because it would fall like 30 meters behind the base of the wall. Um, so it was pretty spectacular. Uh, place to climb, you kind of expect unicorns to start flying around uh, with the rainbow. And Rainmaker is really steep all the way to the top. This is sand like pulling the last move. Um, it's deceptively steep. There's one section which is where I, I think where the water runoff goes and it's really mossy. Uh, but other than that, it's relatively clean. Um, and then you do a steep move to the top and then you're just on these glorious flat grassy ledges. Um, yeah, so you're basically, you're also freezing because you're, by this stage, we were quite wet because we were smashed by the snow melt. Um, so it was quite lovely to get up to the top, hang out in the sun. There's a lovely alpine uh, lake at the top. You can see the, uh, one of the three Lorini peaks. Um, and then the next day, well, I'm not the next day yet, we're still repelling. Uh, and the next day we started hiking up to the Lorini Peaks, uh, which is just an easy sort of slab run. Oh, and you can also see these lines of quartz, which I've never seen so um, prevalent 
Uh, and it was actually, you'll see later in this photo, there's this huge like 30 meter quartz flow. Um, it's, I mean, the rock is just awesome. Uh, that's the Tasman Sea. Uh, these are the other two Lorini peaks. Uh, and that is the valley that runs down to Lake Ada and the Milford track runs across there. Uh, this is just heading over to the other Lorini peaks. And then looking down from the high peak to that's Terra Peak uh, and Lake Terra. I think it's called Lake Terra. We could just call it Lake Terra. Uh, so when we headed down there and we ended up bivying by the lake for a night. This is a 10 year old stash. I forget who stash it was. Stash it was me. It's a stash. <laughs> we found the stash with like 200 meters of static. There was some um, rotting petrol there which we burnt off. And uh, you guys went there 10 years ago and established a whole bunch of routes, some by the lake, some on Terra Peak. There's an article in an old climber about it, uh, which Jimmy had seen, which is why he wanted to go there in the first place. Uh, it was very fortunate that we were, this was in the middle of an 11 day weather spell, which I'd never really experienced in the Darrens before. Um, and I think Ben lost 10 kilos in this 11 day weather spell, just because you know, if you're in the Darrens and the weather's good, you kind of feel obliged, you have to do something cool. Uh, so we were bivying by the lake, uh, mashed potatoes for breakfast, uh, pretty great place to camp. And then the next day we did some Darrens sketchy walking over to Terra Peak. There's a whole bunch of climbs that uh, are just on the left side of here, of this face. Uh, they're like three pictures. 150 meters, uh, and they're really spectacular. There's kind of like typical mountain climbs and, or, or alpine routes in the Darrens, and they are steep but not overhanging mostly, and all the gear is really small um, and requires a lot of faith. <laughs> um, this is the just the hike over there, or the sketchy climb over there. Uh, this is Suji deciding that she wasn't really interested in going straight up and deciding to go up and climb this other face, which had been unclimbed. Uh, and the rock on the second pitch of, uh, of the climb we were on um, was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. It was like this uh, rose tinted, almost like kitchen tile thing where uh, it's like steep, but uh, your, your fingers just like slot perfectly behind these little tiles and it takes great gear and it's just really spectacular. Um, yeah, I've never seen any rock like that before. Uh, this is Ben at the top. Uh, you can see where we came from the previous day. These are the three Lorini peaks and how we came down to the lake in the first place. Uh, this is Jimmy on an iceberg. All of us on the <laughs> uh, and then we walked back up to the top of some bag alley. Uh, and then the next morning, uh, this is getting back down to Sinbad, the top of Sinbad. And we camped at the top of Sinbad. Uh, then you see those crazy um, quartz lines again. And we wanted to try and free this pitch, which is like a bolted 27 ish, which is the top pitch of drop zone I think, but it was actually really wet and we couldn't. But you can also see the free hanging rope here, which uh, again gives you an indication of um, oh, okay. hanging rope. And that's the quartz uh, river, which suits you wearing solo and running shoes. And this is our poo bucket. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how much poo we carried out. <laughs> uh, and this is our same day crew. So I promised you some sport climbing shots. This is Alec at Little Babylon. This is a 32. Uh, Little Babylon, oh, I think this has maybe been around about 15 years as well. What kind of uh, anyway, sport climbing. Uh, it's basically really steep. The easiest climb there is the, well, there's 21, but no one does it. There's really 23 or 4. 
Uh, and every time I go there, I just pull off things I used to be able to climb. It's really um, disheartening. <laughs> uh, but it's always dry, so if you go there and it rains every day, there's still a place you can go climb. This is also a little Babylon. I think this is Colossus. Um, this is also Colossus. This is lands on the Giving Tree. It's a 31. You can't really tell, but it's. It's really steep. And this is Xerxes, which is a 30. Uh, and this is the top of Hercules, which is a 29. And there's a Kia. <laughs> yeah, there's actually tons of Kias in Pilsen. Like the, the numbers are declining all the way through the South Island, except in Pilsen, when they will eat through your tent at some point. Um, this is. Uh, a map of the Darrens, um, and I don't know if anyone can see all these dotted lines, but this is the, the way that we walk into the central Darrens, um, which basically starts in the Holyford Valley and then goes over a whole bunch of coals and until you hit the central Darrens. Uh, this was this year, so it was a year after the major floods. You can still see the debris on the bridge from the flood from the previous year. Uh, this is obviously a massive slip from the flood, uh, which made some of the route finding a little challenging. And you can also see this is the Hollyford, where the road meets the end, or meets the Hollyford River, which used to go this way, and it's been completely redirected. Uh, this is heading up into the Central Darrens. You start going up Moraine Creek and you then head up this cleft uh, until you hit Rainbow Lake. I'm missing out a whole bunch of like flax pulling and snow grass pulling and sketchy hiking. Um, and then this is uh, Tawaiki. Uh, you go over this coal, uh, and at the coal you get to see the Tupukoi Glacier, which is, I think, the non-technical start of the Central Darrens. Uh, this is an area which is just really remote. It's really hard to get to. You probably get about 10 to 15 visitors a year. Uh, you probably run into Richard Thompson there because he tries to go every year. Um, these peaks have roots on them. They might have been repeated. They might not have ever been repeated. Even if you go and try them, you'll probably end up doing a variant of it or some close approximation of it. Um, there's like a three pitch root on this, which is the root of Dur, and this is the Dur and tie rod, this is Karatai, uh, and uh, Naitahu and Tawera, and you can see Madeline in the back as well. Uh, this glacier used to be massive, and now it's shrinking a lot, which makes the access to it a little bit more sketchy. Um, that's at the base of the Tupuloi Glacier. Uh, so basically, we went up on, on the glacier and. Where's the coal, Richard? Is it like over here? I can't even really tell. Somewhere in the middle. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we had a, we had a six, seven day weather window, was forecast. Uh, I'd never been in here. This was Jimmy's fourth time in here, so that was very handy. Because uh, often people go and either underestimate. The approach. I think there was a, a pair of Tasmanian climbers who went the year before. They packed for five days. It took them way longer to get in and get out that they just ended up walking in and then walking out, taking their climbing gear for a walk. So, um, some other friends went into the Central Darrens and out over four days and didn't manage to climb anything. This is on the glacier, uh, looking back down towards the Hollywood. Uh, river Valley, uh, and then once you pop over the coal, this is the Lake Turner surf. So uh, this is also Central Darrens. We're heading for a bivy spot, which is like in here, which is called the Irie, which uh, Richard Thompson, Turner, and Dave Bass sort of discovered about 20 years ago, and it's just a big hole in the rock. Um, we're heading. We didn't know this, but you can actually go this way to get to it, but we didn't know that, so we ended up going down this way over Lindsay's Ledges and all the way over to it, which is like another three hours from here, which is really frustrating because you can see it just over there. Uh, Lindsay's Ledges is 
um, here. Again, this is like this is your typical sketchy walking in the Darrens. Uh, and I can't remember when Lindsay's Legends is from. It was like, is it Lindsay Stewart? Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was like maybe from the 40s or the 50s. But one of those first forays into the region, and it's still like the standard way to get down from the coal towards Lake Turner. Um, this is the Irie. Uh, it's probably the most awesome place I've ever slept. It has a nice. Am I allowed to tell them about the stash up there? Yes, it has a nice stash up there. With sleeping bags and snow grass and a couple of half ropes and a whole bunch of trad gear, which you should probably seek permission to use before you just go in there and use it. Um, it has an amazing view of Totoko, Madeline, and Tawera pretty much all the time. Uh, it's, and it's got pretty decent access to, this is like the Karatai Tawera wall, which is a, has a bunch of roots on it, which are about uh, maybe 250 meters high. We didn't bring our crampons on the first morning, so this is Jimmy just cutting steps with a rock uh, to prevent from sliding. So we spent a number of days in here. The first day uh, we climbed this route called Karabatic Gravity Wells, uh, which was meant to be a 23. I'm pretty sure we didn't climb it because we didn't climb anything of that grade. Um, but it was spectacular. Again, typical of the alpine climbing in that area. Pretty steep in places, very small gear. Thankfully, Richard's stash has about 50 wires in it. Also some very old hands, which do work. <laughs> Oh yeah, you can see the IRE there, so that's that's the camping place in that big cave over there. Uh, this is the top of Karabatic Gravity Wells, uh, looking back down towards the Hollywood Valley and where we had come over the Tukuhoi Glacier. Uh, again, it's like just a fucking spectacular place to be. Uh, this is the the view from the IRE. You can see um, there are some uh, there's some string on the roof which has been set up because Richard Turner is a yurt maker and he has made a custom made tarp to cover this hole perfectly in the event of a storm, which is very handy because the next day was very wet. Uh, and this is the tarp and it just keeps us like, very nice and cozy. Um, that's just some ice the next morning. Uh, so we spent a day in the tarp with terrible weather. Uh, this is a better view of that wall that we climbed on the first day, and then on the next nice day we ended up climbing the south ridge of Tawera, which is up there, and then coming back along the ridge line to the top of Karatai. So this is at the base of south ridge. We took ropes and climbing gear with us, but we ended up not using it because it was pretty chill in terms of technical climbing, although the exposure was uh, very awesome. <laughs> uh, we did put climbing shoes on. Uh, and this is towards the top. And we were very tired when we got to the top, so we ended up having a snooze. Uh, and then we down climbed the same way we went up. Oh, you can see Jimmy here coming across the ridge. Awkwardly sitting on it. Uh, and then heading back up to Karatai. Uh, the view from the top of Karatai is like one of the best views I've ever seen. Uh, looking to the south, um, this is the Tukuhoi Glacier area. This is the Lake Adelaide catchment with uh, Sabre and Marianne Barrier behind it. This is the Don River. Um, Valley, this is the Tiger Ice Ball, this is Mount Underwood, which we climbed the next day, or the day after, and Patuki, and the ridge line that goes up towards Madeline. Toko is behind it, Grave is behind that. That's like close up of the Lake Adelaide Cirque. Uh, you get a really good view of the North Buttress of Sabre, which is like a on everyone's alpine tick list. photos of like the same thing because it was really spectacular. Uh, 
Uh, just an interesting side note, the, the, the person who claimed to first climb to Toko, which is the highest peak in the Darrens, ex ex actually accidentally climbed to Madeline, and then claimed that they climbed to Toko, which is a bit of an error. Okay. Uh, and this is looking out over the Don, the beautiful cloud cover above the Don River Valley, a breakfast spot. Uh, and then we climbed Statue Bro. Uh, again, it's meant to be a 19. We didn't really climb Statue Bro because we climbed at least something that was more like 22. Um, and then the following day, we headed down to the Patuki Karatai Col and then over onto the Taika Ice Fall and then over to Mount Underwood. Some jammy on the glacier. Uh, and you also get a really good view of uh, the southwest ridge of Toko, which is like 2,600 meter climb, which is a third through forest and a third on rock and then a third on, on snow and ice. We didn't climb that, but it's a really good view. This is the top of Underwood. Uh, you can see the deep water basin is there. Uh, and then we went back to camp and we packed up and went back over to the Tempore Glacier because we decided to go up Mount Revelation. This is us regaining the uh, Karatai Revelation Ridge and then uh, climbing up along the rocky part of the ridge uh, and then the snowy part of the ridge to the top of Revelation. Of Revelation, just not much of a view there compared to the views that we had. Uh, and then we dropped down to the Caraco Glacier, um, that is the top of Revelation, and we just kind of went down this ridge onto the glacier and then traversed over. Uh, so this is the Moraine Creek Valley. If you do walk up Hollywood along the Moraine Creek walkway, you eventually get to there, and then you can go over to Lake Adelaide, which is over there, we climbed across these slabs and went way too low and ended up having to come up quite a way and um, ended up uh, having to bivy and we got rained on quite a lot. But the next morning we just followed these uh, tussock fields to Lake Adelaide. Uh, this is us drying out all our stuff. You can see the way we came because this is the Caraco Glacier. Uh, Revelation is over here, so we came down over here and then traversed over and then down this chute onto the moraine. Um, still drying our stuff. This is <laughs> we were really hungry because we didn't we could never really pack enough food for all the activity you, you, you throw into these days. And so on the last day we had a little bit of porridge each and like a handful of peanut and like six squares of chocolate each. And this is near the end, this is on the shoulder of barrier, so we're almost back to where we need to be. And I threw Jimmy his chocolate and he dropped it. <laughs> this is Jimmy retrieving his chocolate. He was there for several minutes because once he got down and grabbed it, he didn't have the energy to pull himself back up. <laughs> uh, and then as you come across towards Gertrude Saddle, you get this great view of um, Milk and Sound and Minor Peak. Uh, so these are some quick photos of running the Milford Track, uh, which we did on Christmas Day. Uh, this is 54k over McKinnon Pass. This is like the old, old uh, Punamu searching route way back before uh, you know we took everything. Um, this is Sutherland Falls. It's 580 meters, uh, highest falls in the country. We decided to go there, which in hindsight was a very poor decision because it took about an hour to get there and back, and we ended up missing the boat on the other side by about 45 minutes. Uh, we got snowed on in the Kenna Pass, which was very Christmassy, and this is us at the wharf with no boat. <laughs> so we had to walk back to the, the dock hut behind us, which was about 3k. 
and we were people who made just things to eat, like this delicious red onion. <laughs> uh, and we have linked us blankets to sleep in because we didn't have any overnight clothes. This is another sport crag, or oh, crag in the Darrens. It's Big Babylon, which preceded Little Babylon. It's not as steep, but it is, as you can see, a really spectacular. There's actually there's only half of it. The other half is um, not as visually spectacular, but is also not as hard. I think the easiest thing on that wall is a, is a 26, which is actually a 28. Uh, and this is John Seddon of Euphrates. This is through it's called the Whore of Babylon, which is the aforementioned 26 over the 28. Oh, I don't know if this will work, but this is Jimmy doing some. I'm not just going to offer any. Ah, maybe this will work. Maybe not. Ah! Oh. Doing some front forward absent <laughs> Mission Impossible style on the Homer Warden Hut Slabs, which is pretty near to the hut and involves uh, like five pitches of slab. These are the easy climbs in the Darrens. Uh, right, so near Homer Hut, um, this is Homer Saddle here. See the road that comes out of the tunnel? Uh, and this is the Alpine Cragging Place. So this is Mount Moya, there's some roots up here, this is Moya's mate, and this is little brother, uh, and this is what the, probably the most popular alpine climbs are in the Darrens. They are uh, a day trip from Homer Hut. Uh, this is looking down from Talbot's Ladder. Talbot's Ladder is, was first climbed in 1909 and is considered the first rock roof of the whole region. Um, so you can see the, the road coming into Homer Tunnel on the other side. You walk up this valley up to the Homer, uh, the Homer Saddle and then across to Moyes Mate. Climb six, seven pitches to the top, down and all the way back. Easily done in a day. Uh, this is the top part of Talbot's Ladder, which is uh, it's quite steep and exposed, but again, it's non-technical. Oh, and you can also see this big, huge steel peg, which was used to protect back at the early 20th century, I guess. Uh, same shot, sorry, same features, Mount Moya, uh, Moya's mate and the little brother. Uh, this is Paul heading over from Homer Saddle to Mount Moya, and this is Lucky Strike, which is probably the most popular alpine route in the Darrens. It's mostly bolted, it takes like two bits of tread gear, it's a grade 20, it's like six pitches, and it was quite controversial when it was bolted. I think it's got like 50 or 60 bolts in it, and it sparked this whole debate about where people should bolt in the Darrens, whether it should be acceptable, um, and some people thought that there should be no bolts above a certain altitude, and there's a few routes on Moyers, mate, that have bolts. None are quite so bolted as, as Lucky Strike. Uh, I don't really have an opinion on that, but it's a cool route. Uh, here's a couple of climbers on Mate's Little Brother. They're quite hard to see. The rock here is just like, it's really spectacular. It's extremely grippy. Uh, Lucky Strike was the first climb I did here with um, the in inimitable Neil Parker. Somewhere. Yeah, Derek. And you know, we went out and climbed Lucky Strike, uh, and it was wet and foggy, but the, there's just so much friction on the rock that you know you will never want to climb the pains again. <laughs> um, this is a route called Vindication, which is a fully bolted route on Mount Moya. The name was pretty much this is such an awesome route. So if you don't like our bolts. In the and we feel vindicated. <laughs> um, it's like six pitches. This is full on the 24 pitch. Uh, it's right above the road. And that's Paul's best way. 
Uh, this is the Chevelle section coming back towards Homer Saddle. Uh, this is often the best way to go across the section. Um, this is another part of the Downs, this is Charismatic Wall. This is a, a route called Uprising, which was established a few, just a few years ago, I think. It's 19 pitches, uh, it's grade 24, all the hard all the hard moves on it are bolt protected, although you do need a rack. Uh, this is a pitch called Camille's Pillar, which is uh, an ode to Camille's height. If she was a bit taller, it would probably be more like a grade 16, but it's more like a 21. And this is the top of Charismatic Wall. Uh, you can see, you see McPherson up there. Uh, and this is looking towards Talbot. Uh, a very fun uh, day adventure is to do the McPherson Talbot Traverse, where you got McPherson across to Traverse Pass, which is just over the snow bit, and then down towards Gertrude Saddle, and then all the way back to the hut. Uh, this is Gertrude Saddle, which is the popular day hike. Um, it's also a great view of Mitre Peak uh, and the Twins and the Sentinel. Um, this is heading up from Gertrude Saddle. You can see Crosscut in the background, uh, and this is the way to access, or the best one of the ways to access the uh, climbs on the north face of Barrier Peak. This is on the shoulder of uh, Barrier Knob. Uh, and just to the left here is Lake Adelaide, so uh, this is one of the most spectacular views, I think, in the Darrens. Uh, it's looking out towards, uh, to the north. Uh, you can see Sabre over here again, with the very prominent North Buttress, uh, and Lake South America next to Lake Adelaide. And this is the ridge line that heads across to Barrier, Marion, and Sabre. Uh, so these are the climbs on the north face of Barrier. This is the first pitch of Endless Summer, which we climbed to get to Sidewinder, uh, above Lake Adelaide and Lake South America. Sidewinder is a really technical slab 23. This is all on the crux pitch. Uh, it's right next to Labyrinth, which is considered like the best space climb in the country. It's also very typical of this area. Labyrinth has a 40 meter crux pitch, which I thought had eight bolts in it, but Richard tells me it actually only has five bolts in it. And it also has like a 16 meter run out section uh, where you clip three bolts and then you don't have any gear until you hit the anchor. It was also bolted on lead, so you know that if you make it to a bolt, you have a nice stance. <laughs> and this is looking down towards the Grave Talbot um, saddle, which, from McPherson, this was the mail route. So before the road was there, uh, people would go up home the saddle and then across to Grave Talbot and then down here to the Esperance River Valley just to deliver the mail. <laughs> And this is fucking sketchy. <laughs> um, the guidebook says, basically, it's easy if you know where to go, but it's just typical of the area. That it's super easy not to know. Or it's not obvious where to go anyway. Uh, and I think the first time they went down here, they had to bang in all these steel pegs and repel them. I ended up having to down climb a waterfall, which was not ideal. This is from the Great Talbot Saddle straight down to the Esperanza River Valley. Um, yeah, and there's the Don River Valley at the end of it. Uh, and then eventually when you go out there, you hit a trail which takes you to the road. The trail's actually closed because of the floods. But you can't tell that if you come from this side. Another gear, destroying my approach here. And drinking our beer. <laughs> Uh, and this is just heading back out to walk from Gertrude Saddle. And now we're on the Kepler track, which is 60k and not nearly as nice as the Norfolk track. But, you know, pretty nice. Uh, this is just a quick snap of the notch route up Talbot, which is your sort of typical steep grass covered slopes uh, meandering through to get to the notch, 
and then following the uh, ridge up to the top of Talbot, which gives you another spectacular and different view. Uh, actually, it's a really good shot of Christina, which is like the third or fourth almost peak in the Downs. Uh, and in the last weather window this year, uh, we went up to Toko Valley. I think we've been up to Toko Valley um, to try and do some first ascents in the Cirque area, which uh, Jimmy had seen on a previous trip. This is us crossing the Totoko River. This is the Cirque area. There is a bivvy over here, which is called Turner's Biv, just named after, I think, Samuel Turner, who was one of the first pioneers in the area in the 30s. Um, and Jimmy had kind of just seen this area, in particular this wall here. So it's hard to tell, but I think this is basically like 300 meters from here to here. And half of it is this massive flake, which is detached from the wall. We didn't know this at the time. Um, so this is like a very different adventure where we walked in, we rappelled down here, we obviously weren't entirely sure whether we'd be able to get out, and we ended up doing all this kind of sketchy, typical Garen sketchy hiking to get to the base here. Um, and then we ended up trying to, well, we ended up climbing the chimney behind the flake and then the crack on the front of it. Uh, and then various things happened, which meant that we ended up sleeping here uh, and eventually descended down these slabs and then across into this push to get up, uh, which I'll go into a bit more. This is us just heading up to Turnersburg. This is Turnersburg, uh, a very luxurious rock. Um, looking over at Totoko. Uh, and this is the top of where we started heading down to uh, to the flake. So there's a different view of the flake. You can see now, uh, this is where we ended up sleeping for a few nights. Um, and Ben and Jimmy ended up climbing the massive chimney behind the flake. We did want to get to the head wall, but we ended up not climbing the head wall for various reasons. Also because it looked really hard and not very predictable. Also because we were quite tired in general. This is us at the base gearing up for what we were hoping would be a nice easy first ascent. It's probably like midday and um, we thought we'd try and go up here but there's no gear here until you get to this crack so it just means you have to solo and there was quite a few hard moves at the bottom so we each tried it um, and there's also this really fun uh, water mode at the bottom, which is called Natural Creature. But mainly I've got this photo to show you that I climbed up here and was on these like slopey, mossy holes below the first pro. Got really intimidated, so uh, kind of backed down again to have my foot on this ledge, which is meant to be like the good resting spot. Uh, and then just kind of relaxed, and then my foot popped off, and I ground fell into this moat. Mm -hmm. And pretty sure I broke my tailbone because, you know, it really hurt to shit for several weeks afterwards. <laughs> and Google says that's a really short sign that you've broken your tailbone. So at one o'clock, I was basically in a heap at the base of this climb. Where did you go? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, because we were at the base of the chimney anyway, um, we kind of all decided, well, Jimmy and Ben should go and climb the chimney anyway, while I just kind of sat there. We were showing our, our excellent experience. Uh, I had left my first aid kit at Turner's Bivy, uh, so it didn't have any first aid or any um, painkillers or anti Uh So they thought they'd just run up the chimney in an hour or two and come back, and then they ended up getting back at, like, uh, 6.30 p.m., um, at which point I was just kind of over here on the grass, uh, they'd gone up the chimney, uh, they came back and they were like, well, it's going to get dark soon, so uh, I'm obviously going to stay the night there while the other guys go back up to Turner's Bib uh, and get some medical supplies, which would be 
nice. Um, so they then went up and tried to find the easiest way out. This is like near, nearly sunset. You can't really see, but there's, uh, there's a guy here. Uh, this is our sketchy approach where we go up this corner and then traverse over this way um, and then go up here. Uh, and then they decided that the best way out was was uh, up that way. You can see here the headlamps. But it ended up not being so easy. I think Jimmy said it was like a grade 20 four pitch, really shit gear, and they didn't get back to Turnersburg until about 2 in the morning, at which point they were quite tired. Uh, and then they thought that it might be better just to leave, so they grabbed all of our stuff, mine included, and rappelled back down the next day, uh, leaving uh, most of the gear at the base of the rappel. And then they came back to where I was, in which time it was about 24 hours since I'd fallen on my bum. Um, uh, and then I finally had some painkillers and some anti inflam and then we decided that we weren't going to do anything for the rest of the day. But by evening, we thought it, well, I thought I was probably okay enough to help them go rescue our gear. So then we went back to the base of the repels, grabbed all the gear, and brought it back down. Uh, so we ended up camping here. Uh, they named it Camp Derek because obviously we wouldn't have been there if I hadn't fallen on my bum. Uh, and it was actually a really luxurious place to sleep. It's like nice and flat. There's lots of snow grass everywhere. As you can see, the view is not disagreeable. Um, and the next day, you can kind of see the crack here. It goes up and then kind of splits. You can also see that there's a lot of uh, garden stuff to do here. Uh, and there's actually an off width at the top. So then Ben and I went and tried to climb this the next day. Uh, I was, um, well, paracetamol and tramadol. Uh, this has been, this has been encountering the shrubbery. Uh, and it's interesting in this photo that the first piece of gear is like several, several meters up. Uh, it's interesting because Ben actually fell about here or a bit further up. Uh, and me being a diligent, responsible delayer, I had slung this big um, uh, rock in front of me. But Ben is also a lot heavier than I am, so when he fell, uh, I got thrown straight up, and my sling on my rock also got thrown straight up. And because the first bit of gear is way over here, I ended up being like catapulted across the rock wall, uh, losing a nice chunk of my shoulder, and. Um, <laughs> Basic beginner errors that you think we would probably be able to avoid. But fortunately, I had some tramadol in my pocket <laughs> uh, and ended up following up this crack half of the way because um, it actually uh, done such a poor uh, job of this rope drag that uh, he just had to build an anchor at some point. But anyway, we got to the top uh, and then um, played around in the chimney and eventually came back down. We had a look at the hip wall, but it looked way too hard and way too scary. Um, and so we decided to bail, and the next day we went uh, and found a different way up, other than the 4 pitch 20 r uh, This was one way we tried, but eventually backed off of, because as you can see, it's covered with steep grass. Um, and this is the way we eventually went, which may look a little bit steeper, but it's way less grassy. Um, and uh, we got out of the Cirque and we were going to go and climb the South Ridge of Milne, um, but the NZ Topo map actually has Milne in the wrong place, so we ended up climbing next to Milne. So this is us uh, reaching the ridge line and this looks back to Lake Turner, which is the sort of photos that I showed you guys earlier. Uh, that's Tawera and there's Karatai, and this is Cliff Creek, which runs out for the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's Lake Turner again, so a slightly different view. Uh, and that is actually Milne that we're looking towards, and this is Underwood, um, and then all the peaks above Lake Turner. So we ended up climbing this peak, up this ridge, these two peaks, it was just like a pretty easy three-pitch route. 
uh, which was mostly scrambly. This has been just coming over the first peak. Um, again, it's a spectacular place to be. Uh, and then when we went back down, we had, we'd seen this uh, crack route, which is this like long, continuous crack. It's actually a lot steeper than it looks, and it's probably 100 plus meters long. Um, so while we were there in the evening, we thought we'd just try it. This is Jimmy uh, climbing the bottom of it. Uh, he ended up only going up about this high, and then slinging a rock and wrapping off, which is maybe like 15 meters or so just to get a taste of it, but it was a pretty spectacular uh, crack line. And we also went down just where it started getting a bit hard. Uh, and this is us uh, heading off down and out. Um, we spent a week in there. Um, it's this beautiful slab and then a bunch of waterfalls, uh, which we avoided by uh, heading over to the right into the more bushy section. Uh, this is Jimmy rappelling off a of flax bush. Uh, which he was sure would hold, and Ben is an arborist, and he said that when they remove flax bushes, they actually need massive cranes, so they are really solid. And because Jimmy probably weighs, you know, a lot more than I do, and I know Ben weighs a lot more than I do because of the way I, uh, what happened to me while I was belaying him, I was quite happy to belay off this flax bush after they'd gone forth first. Uh, lots of beautiful falls on the way out. Uh, Jimmy had some issues with his clothing. <laughs> um, <laughs> his pants are actually inside out because uh, he thought that this was uh, the more acceptable social version of, of how to wear his clothes. Uh, and this is us heading back out uh, to Togo River Valley. Uh, so the last little section I have here, if none of you have fallen asleep yet, is a friend of a friend had a boat and we went out and climbed the top of the point. So these climbs have been developed uh, sort of in the last five or maybe six or seven years now. Uh, this is straight out of Milford Sound. Um, this is the copper point wall. This is the Tomoko, which is a 10 pitch climb. Um, although some of the pitches are really short. We climbed Tomoko, we climbed, which is uh, mostly bolted 25. Uh, straight out of lockdown, which was put out during lockdown, uh, which is over this side, um, which is uh, more trad, also 25. Um, you can see the slab that goes to the top as well, which was Shipper Falls, which is a full pitch 19. Uh, and a little to the right, oh, this is, um, yeah, so this is the slab, which is Shipper Falls. Uh, over here is uh, a rocky outcrop where you can actually get dropped off by boat uh, and you just jump out onto this craggy part which is covered in seals. And uh, this is a little to the right. This is the Boshima boat face wall, which has two climbs on it. Uh, apparently it's the best rock in the Darrens. Uh, I didn't climb that face, but apparently it's the best rock in the Darrens. Not, and it's also a lot harder. I think the climbs there are like 28 or 29. And this is a Titanic Prowl, which is an unseen project. But as you can see, it looks very spectacular. Uh, and then above is the north face of Mitre Peak, which has been scrambled up. Uh, there's probably some technical climbs up there as well. Uh, so we were camping just here. Uh, boat, as you can see. Uh, very awesome place to camp, except there are fuck tons of sand flies. So the beta we were given when climbing here, uh, this is straight out of lockdown, which has a whole bunch of um, cracks in it. Um, we did get annihilated by sand flies on the last pitch on this one. Uh, this is the first 25 pitch of Tomoko. You can't really see, but Honza has um, socks over his ankles, which is the beta to keep sand flies off of you when you climb. Uh, we had deep with us, which we sprayed on us. But other than the sand flies, it's, it's a pretty amazing experience. Right above the water, really awesome orange rock. Um, you climb through a roof, um, and then you top out onto this beautiful plateau, um, which is uh, really flat, gives you a great view of the north face of Mitre Peak as well. 
this is the walk down, which includes uh, a swimming hole and an obligatory jump into a swimming hole. I think Hans is doing some sort of Ministry of Silly Walks thing there. Uh, we had a couple of uh, diving fishers with us who grabbed some crayfish, so this is us eating crayfish over the fire. Uh, these are the morning sandflies in the tent. Uh, this is Hayden kind of soloing up because we went to climb Shipper Falls on our third day there, but we usually jump off where all the seals are. Um, it was getting smashed by the wind, so we ended up getting dropped off around the other side, which just meant kind of just soloing up this uh, easy but not very flat section. Um, but we also had all these tourist boats pull up behind us, um, which I can imagine were like, this is a popular climbing area, but this is not really the usual approach to the climb. Not really quite sure what these guys are doing, and as you can see, they've got their ropes over their necks. Um, so maybe we'll just leave before something bad happens. Uh, this is the Shipper Falls four pitch slab climb, which is actually really awesome. Uh, it's mostly bolted as well. Uh, this is the rocky out where all the seals are. Uh, and this is the Bodie McGoat face wall. This is the top pitch of Big Fish, which I think is a 26. Uh, and as you can see, the rock is pretty spectacular. You're climbing right above the water. like five or six pitches uh, and you can repel into it or it's quite involved as well. And I think that's it. That's it. Any questions? Any questions? Very good. Question. How much camera gear you take? A lot of these are taken on my phone. But I have a Sony A7 III, which I talked to Sinbad and the Central Darrens and Tatoka. How are you taking photos on like halfway people climbing? Oh, yes, I am. How are you taking photos of people climbing halfway to like a hundred meter pitch? Uh, these shots were taken from the top anchor. Uh, so I climbed the slab with my camera and then walked over to the top and repelled in. Uh, which then meant you have to ascend out, and it was kind of a free hanging rope, so it was, it was very interesting. <laughs> Alright, well, thanks for this spectacular and adventurous presentation. Thank you.